Hello. Welcome to Backdoors and Breaches. Um, we, it's kind of the release party, I guess, even though it was sort of DerbyCon. We should have had some pictures of uh, DerbyCon whenever we handed them out. How many did we hand out in that hour? Was it like 800 of them the, in less than an hour? Yeah, so we handed, handed out 802 hours, but 300 in the first like 20 minutes. Yeah, it was it was insane. People were lining up like it was an iPhone release event. Um, yes, so cool. So one of the questions that's going to be coming up again and again and again is where can I get these and when? And Deb has her copy and paste ready to rock and roll to let people know when you can get these and uh, where you can actually track. But uh, it's a lot of work to get to the point where you have a DAC. Uh, like this. There's a tremendous amount of uh, effort that went into designing the game, designing the cards and the box, and then ordering the boxes, getting demo sets. And um, we, how many are we buying? Are we buying 8,000 or 10,000 of these, Jason? Uh, we purchased 10,000 plus the 1,000 for DerbyCon. So we're at 11,000. Yeah. Now. So, and we have pictures. Maybe Jason can bring up some pictures at the end of the webcast to show you what a thousand the of these cards actually Palette looks like cards. yeah but it comes in a palette it's like brewster's millions since we're talking about 80s movies whenever there was like three million dollars on a palette it looks like that only not three million dollars and um we'll, we'll go through and kind of describe the game but i'm going to go through and do the opening with the uh, sound because people love that we were talking about it before the show so you open that up with a satisfying pop and a crack pull it out and once you get it um it's all wrapped makes that crackling noise that the kids seem to like and um, it actually has a relatively easy way of opening up the actual package you just zip that there you go and you promptly throw the plastic on the floor and then you got your deck so the deck is broken down into a series of different types of cards and i'm going to walk through what the different colored cards are uh, but each of the cards has a specific color on the back that is uh, representative of its role within the game. You also have some additional cards that I guess you could call jokers. Uh, one for ADHD and Rita. Uh, another one we've got to get some marketing in for AI Hunter. And then also a card marketing for Black Hills Information Security. And then a card dedicated to black backdoors and breaches. And it gives you the website. I don't know if people can see this. It gives you the website of where you can go to get the instructions to play. Now, these will be for sale here shortly, um, the next couple of months. We have to get a pallet of like two, 3,000, and then we have to send it to Amazon, and Amazon has to load it in the store and all of that. And Jason, uh, we, we settled on a price of $10 for a deck, right? Correct. Yep. Each you want to talk a little bit about that $10 and why? Yeah, so when we analyzed like, the amount of money that went into the, the development uh, the production, the printing, the cost that Amazon tag taps on tags, tax, tax, tax. Let's go with tags, taxes, tax. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the amount that Amazon adds to each, um, each shipment, uh, it came out to about $8 and 95 cents per deck. So the development cost, printing cost, all the costs that went into it's about $8 and 95 cents a deck. Uh, and then we added a dollar onto it to help, um, for all the things that we don't know about, uh, so like sales tax or this or something that because we've never sold a product before. So mm -hmm. there's that extra dollar. So it's ten dollars. Uh, we're not really making any money on these. We just want to get them out to people. Yep. But we want, you know, we, we wanted to figure out what was the least amount of money we could charge and still uh, not lose money. So that yep. was ten dollars. So there'll be 10 bucks a pack, and then eventually we're gonna start coming up with the boosters and expansion cap packs, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later. All right, so let's jump in. Uh, marketing, of course, this is brought to you by Black Hills Information Security. It is also about, brought to you by AI Hunter. Um, AI does not stand for artificial intelligence, it stands for actual intelligence, um, actual intelligence hunter. And instead of a demo, one of the things that we're doing now uh, for people joining the webcast is we're now offering free training. Um, if you want to register for free network threat hunting training, and this is all about free tools using things like NTOP and Rita and using T-Shark, and you really want to become a, a packet hunting guru, you need to sign up for this. It's going to be about a one to two day training. It'll be coming out in the next couple of months, and it's going to be taught by SANS instructors. It's going to be taught by me. It's going to be taught by SANS instructor fellow Chris Brenton and also SANS instructor Bill Stearns. So it is really, truly, and completely 
um, that sans quality training, two days, network threat hunting, packets, and finding evil on the network, and it's all free. So if you'd like to get signed up for this free training, just type in training into the questions window. We will capture that. Just type in training. Or you can type in the entire string, uh, training script alert document dot cookie, close the script, or one equals one, semicolon dash dash, and that'll get you set up. Um, for training, and like I said, it's completely free. It'll be about two days. We will record it. There will be labs, all kinds of hands-on stuff. So please check that out. All right, so let's get started. So why did we go through the effort to create this? Um, there was a couple of reasons. Um, Jason and I have been kind of working on various games um, for years now. I, I think the first one was Cubicles and Compromises. And that was basically using a 20-sided dice as part of an incident response tabletop exercise, where every single action, you would have to roll a dice. And if you had the procedures for that action, you would get a plus three modifier. And that was the core game. We ran into a huge problem with the game, though. Um, we ran into a problem whenever anybody else tried to play that game. If they didn't have a dedicated scenario associated with that game, then they completely fall apart, fell apart. And people didn't understand scenarios, they didn't know how to create the scenarios, and it was a big issue. So that kind of worked. Then Jason was working on a game. Um, I think it was myself, Larry Pesci. I can't remember who the other instructors were. Um, that was uh, Pivots and Payloads. And Pivots and Payloads was like a shoots and ladders or Candyland style game where you would go through a penetration test and there would be the different things, you know, helping the pen tester or not. And we've kind of been working on these games for a long time. And I was, uh, you know, the, the whole co concept of how we came up with, cute, with backdoors and breaches is a bit weird. Um, it actually started, I don't have the cards with me. Um, it actually started, uh, there was a vendor from China that had a card deck that was malware's most wanted. And they had a whole bunch of malware on each of the cards and it was a regular playing deck of cards. And they had cool pictures of each of the malware for like representation purposes. And I thought that was really, really neat. So I'm playing with this deck of cards and we do a lot of tabletop exercises at Black Hills Information Security. And when most of the time when we do tabletop exercises, I do it. And um, that's mainly because I can come up with scenarios relatively quickly. I can roll with the punches. If they say that there's weird things in their network, we can make that happen. And when we tried to have someone else at BHIS do it, it would have varying levels of success. Uh, some people did great, some people did less than great. And we wanted to standardize a way that we could very quickly and easily create a uh, tabletop exercise. And I created four columns. Um, initially. So there were four columns and I basically made it so the BHIS employee could choose uh, which of the different tactics in each of the four columns they wanted to actually deal with. So the four columns were initial uh, compromise, pivot and escalate, um, persistence and then C2 and exfil. And that started out as a spreadsheet. And I think I was talking with Jason, we we're kind of talking about this and Jason's constantly pushing for new cool things, whether it's posters or games or any of these different things, kind of bring people in um, for creating content for the community as a whole. And I'm like, well, we could create a card game around this. And that's really how this all started and took, took a lot of those ideas from pivots and payloads, cubicles and compromises and rolled it into this game. And the core goal of the game was to try to make it fun. And it was also to get around the arguments over what and what does not work. Um, when you're doing a tabletop exercise, it's very, very common for people to say, well, you know, we got malware on that system. Well, that's not possible. We're running Silence or cr like CrowdStrike or something like that. And the vendor told me that there's no way malware can run on this system. So that scenario is completely broken because we have this product. And you get into these huge arguments over what would and would not work in what scenarios. Also, you run into these problems with uh, incomplete attack scenarios where it's like, okay, I'm going to do this tabletop exercise and it's on a spearfish. And okay, we've contained it, but now what? And that's why we came up with the four different cards kind of taking the attack and really, really boiling it down to like the four things that people can deal with insofar as incident response. And there was also magical unicorn hacks. I would sit on tabletop exercises and then people would say, well, what if somebody was able to come up with a zero day for our firewall and our proxy and then another zero day for our database server and another zero day for our web server? What would we do that? It's like, well, then you're dealing with magical unicorn attacks. And as the little picture says, you know, some days you just gotta say, screw it, I'm gonna be a unicorn. But those those really messed up magical unicorn style attacks don't actually help organizations because you have organizations that fall into the trap of, well, we've got a patch against Rowhammer 
or Spectre or Meltdown. And while those are important, more than likely, those aren't the things that are actually going to get, uh, they're not actually going to get used against your organization. Um, now that changes over time, but when you're looking at a lot of the attack strategies, we wanted the attack strategies to actually be applicable to real world organizations and what they would actually encounter as well. So the state of play, if you're playing this game, um, you have some, you have three roles, right? So the first role is the incident master. Um, when we created the game, it was there to facilitate the incident master. It was basically designed so the incident master could very quickly and easily choose one card from the initial attack and compromise, one from the pivot, one from the C2, and one for the lateral or for the uh, uh, lateral movement. And they could build that incident on the fly. They didn't have to spend a lot of time knowing exactly how it was going to work and storybooking it. Because Cubicles and Compromise was all based off of Dungeons and Dragons. Whenever I'd play that with my kids and, uh, and we'd walk through it, you know, the, the scenarios were rich and there were stories and that was awesome. But I found out that in order for Cubicles and Compromises to work, you needed to have a literal story in a scenario for every single one of the games and that didn't allow for complexity that didn't allow for replayability that didn't allow for imagination and all those different things so with the four cards it allowed you to build the incident and made that incident creation dynamic um, and the incident master is also there to keep the game going as you're going through cubicles and compromises it, and then eventually into back doors and breaches you were recording what procedures your organization was missing and how those procedures could actually be useful and actually dealing with that incident. Um, that's the whole goal, right? We wanna find procedures and technical failings in our organization that we need to fill as an organization. And the only way you can do that is by gaming this and doing this again and again and again and again and identifying those different procedures that are missing. Now the players, the players can be the incident response team. It can be the entire company that's part of the tabletop exercise. And the players themselves they will pull uh, one of these random procedure cards. And these procedure cards, uh, when you're playing it just as a standalone, you pull four. If you're playing it for your company, you will get a procedure card for each of the procedures that your company has. So if you have procedures for user behavioral and entity analytics, you get that card. If you have one for endpoint security protection analysis, you get that card. Internal segmentation, you get that card. So you get the card for the procedures that you have, and you'll see just how much easier the game is once you have those procedures. But by default, you get four uh, in the state of play. And you discuss and you take actions. And any action you take in dealing with the incident moving forward, every single action that you're gonna take, you're gonna roll dice. And uh, the dice is really the third roll. Um, the dice, they get rolled. If it's 11 and over, then the action you take is successful. If it's 10 and lower, not lover, hold on. <laughs> fix that. <laughs> this game just got weird. Yeah, um, it did. Kinky incident response games. Um, if it's 10 and lower, then the action that you take fails. Now, anytime you take an action associated with the procedures that you have, you get a plus three modifier on your role. And that's to highlight if an organization actually has documented procedures and the technology in place, then they're far more effective at incident response. So whatever procedure cards you pull, you're able to uh, get, get a higher probability of that being successful. Now, a couple of other things that didn't make it into the slides. If you roll a one or a 20, then an inject card is pulled. And I'll talk more about the inject cards here in just a little bit. And the inject cards are designed to add some additional randomization to the game and create more conversation topics. Now the injects um, will be like management approves a new procedure. You get a new randomized procedure. Um, legal takes your only skilled incident handler into a meeting to explain the incident. I'll talk about that some more. Bobby the intern kills the system you're reviewing. The lead handler has a baby and takes family medical leave. Uh, give the defenders a random procedure card. Take one procedure card away. That's where procedure you find out is actually broken. Sim analyst returns from Splunk training. So anything according, uh, associated with log action gets a plus two modifier. The data is uploaded to Pastebin in the middle of an incident because that sucks. Um, we also have it was all a, just a pen test. So you, this ends the game immediately, and the incident master has to turn over all the cards. Basically, you're able to detect a pen test, and that actually happens. And then honeypots deploy. As soon as you deploy honeypots, then you have to give the uh, pivot and escalate card to the defenders. So you pull one of these cards in the event that a 1 or a 20 is rolled, or if you fail at rolling three times in a row. So here in a bit, CJ is going to play. 
You can hear him rolling. He's practicing and warming up. If he fails at his rolls three times in a row, then we're going to pull a procedure card. And that's, once again, uh, we do that to keep the game moving. Um, otherwise, you just sit there and watch somebody rolling the dice again and again and again. Now, if CJ rolls 10 times, if CJ rolls 10 times, boom, then you fail. Um, we have to have an end to the game. Um, so you can see what procedures would have been more helpful in that particular scenario. All right, so D&D &D Roots, uh, the goal is to build conversation. Uh, the best thing about Dungeons and Dragons is that it was a non-deterministic game when I was a kid. Um, it wasn't like, uh, like I said, shoots and ladders or um, Candyland where you just kind of go around the board and then things happen. It was building conversations. You know, you'd have a conversation about how you take out a dragon and how you take down a whole bunch of skeletons. And, and the dungeon master was there to keep that game moving, make sure that everyone was having a good time. Also, it's designed to track missing procedures. If you're playing this game and you find out that you're missing some procedures, it's time to write those down. And then go back and say, we need to have this technology, these procedures in place whenever we're dealing with an incident. Also to talk through how your organization would handle certain issues. Um, when you're working through incident response and you're playing a game, you get these things like all of a sudden the data is uploaded on Pastebin. How are we going to handle that? Um, in fact, we have a card in here, a procedure card called Crisis Management. And the Crisis Management card is designed to get people to say, okay, we need to have a team whose sole purpose in life is dealing with crisis management. If we all of a sudden have an incident, how are we going to deal with that incident? How are we gonna deal with this in the public? How are we gonna communicate with Brian Krebs? Um, so that crisis management card kind of neutralizes that data is uploaded to pastebin card. So like I said, it's not monopoly. You're not going through and every single action tells you exactly what you're going to do. The incident master decides. Um, so if you try to do something stupid, like, uh, well, we decide to give up and take a nap. Well, you can roll a dice on that, but that doesn't actually forward you through the game. And the incident master can make a call one way or the other about what's being done. It I also helps to get into the rules. Yeah, go ahead, CJ. Yeah, it's just very important to remember. I mean, I remember years and years and years of role playing. The purpose of the game, and this one particularly, is to learn, to facilitate learning. If something's not working or you feel like doing your own inject or modifying it, it's a game, folks. Play. Yep, yep. And we'd like those injects and modifiers to be sent to us so we can put it into an expansion <laughs> pack. Yes. Um, but, but that's just it. It's meant to be a game. And I would also say if you're an incident master and you're playing this game, the goal is not to punish. If you ever played Dungeons and Dragons and you have a DM that's just an ass where you're like, okay, you're confronted a dragon. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to attack it. And he's like, well, the dragon steps on you because you're stupid. It's like, that's not fun. Um, that doesn't make the game interesting. It's just being mean. So the incident master isn't there to be mean. The incident master is to facilitate the uncovering of missing procedures and technologies in organizations as well. Um, so I want to break down the cards. Uh, so all of the cards are broken down into these common sections. Of course, you have the title, you have text. Um, there's a little bit of text that kind of describes uh, the overall approach for the attack or the C2 or the pivot or the escalation. Um, but it's getting you kind of a little taste as far as what that is. If anything, it's there mainly to help you Google. If you're Googling certain tools, you can you know, Google certain words and maybe it's going to help you out. Suggested D text. That's kind of important. For each one of the attack cards that's drawn, there's a section called detection, and it's su suggested detext. Um, so, so we have all the procedures here, and the detection section basically says if any of the defenders take those actions and they roll successfully, then they should get this card. And that helps any of the incident masters that say, well, I don't know if that would detect this or not. We actually have the detection built right into the card. Now, the incident master can make a decision no matter what they want to do. Uh, so if it's not on this card, but the defending team is doing something in a novel way, like we're trying to detect spear phishing and we're trying to use honey pots to detect if our website was actually scraped, that's really crafty and that's super creative. It's not on the card as a detection, but give them, give them credit for it. Let them roll um, and see how it actually works out. But it's there to help kind of those junior incident responders or those incident handlers and those incident masters that are playing the game get a better idea as far as what cards tie up with different stages of the attacks. Then we also have example tools. Um, and I, I, I took the logos of a bunch of these different tools. Um, no, I was not able to get permission from all the developers of these tools. We predominantly used open source tools uh, for these as much as possible. And if anyone is wondering why, um, one, I was lazy and I was very busy. And two, you can use logos for tools if it's done for educational purposes and comparisons. 
Um, and that's exactly what we're doing with this game. It's all part of education. So we have tools like even Evil Engine X, we have GoFish, we have Cred Sniper. And then at the bottom, we have, instead of example tools, uh, we have links uh, that you can do. This is what I get for actually writing the slides at 3 a.m. Um, we have links that you can go to to get uh, more information about what this card actually means. And yes, a lot of the links are actually Black Hills Information Security blogs because we do a lot of blogs and well, this is also kind of marketing. But there's some other websites uh, that are not BHIS centric websites as well. So you've got a whole bunch of things if you're trying to learn this approach of this attack, you have tools, you have blogs, you have walkthrough, you have example detections. So it really helps you get better at your trade craft as a security professional. Um, if we're trying to deal with phishing, how do we fish? How do we test our organization? Um, what are some pitfalls that you run into with phishing? And what are some tools that I can use to evaluate our ability to be resilient against phishes as well? Um, I want to pause for a couple of seconds. Is there any... Um, questions that i should be answering oh my god that's a lot of people that want training <laughs> yeah I, I got one for you yeah uh, thanks like like a dnd monster is there a way to determine the difficulty for the scenario given combination of cards no there isn't um there are some cards that i actually threw in here um whenever i was setting up the scenario um and really a lot of it is just rolling and trying to identify those procedures but there are some that i actually threw in um uh, that were really 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 hard um so like this one is evil firmware. Um, evil firmware, if I read it to you, it says the attacker updates the firmware of a network card, video cards, BIOS, UEFI with evil. All of these are very difficult to detect and very difficult to update. And it says detection is endpoint security protection analysis, endpoint analysis and prayers to an engaged and merciful God. Um, so no, we didn't actually set up modifiers for how difficult each of these DTECs would be. Um, for the expansion pack, I am planning on doing that. Um, for certain types of attacks, like if we do WNF malware, um, one of the things that we wanna do is your, your role is automatically reduced by two because it's just that much more difficult to detect. But the goal for this game is to try to make it as easy and as approachable as possible. We didn't wanna to have to have people whip out an abacus uh, for every single action that was gonna be taken. All right, so any other questions? Uh, that's it for now. I just want to, you know, some of the feedback we've gotten is people went from never playing to playing within 45 minutes and having some of the best conversation they've ever had in their organization. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some the goal, break out as well. <laughs> the goal is to get up and running as quickly as possible. Yep. People were asking about the dice, and then so here is the BHIS dice that we have. Yeah, and I've got one of these tubs is filled with Black Hills Information Security dice. Here's if you ever want dice, dice, just come to it. With. Just come to uh, uh, just uh, come into the uh, uh, any any conference that we're at. We have all this is handed out for free. All right, so I want to go through each of the cards, um, not each of the cards, but each of the categories of cards. So the first one that we have is initial attack and compromise. Um, so we call it just initial compromise cards. And with the initial compromise cards, that's how an organization was actually attacked. So that is the vector. So we have credential stuffing, exploitable external services, bring your own exploited device, social engineering, trusted relationships, password spraying, insider threat, cloud access, web server compromises, and phishing. Um, so when we're looking at how we initially get access to environments um, in our penetration tests and incident response, these are the main ways that we see. And that doesn't mean that these are the only ways. I've already had some people that are like, well, you know, uh, you don't have this card, you don't have this card, you don't have this card. We had to keep it to 52 uh, for the core deck. So there will be more with expansion packs, but this will cover the vast majority of the exploits that your organization will encounter. So in a bit, when I'm playing with CJ, I'm gonna pull one of these randomized uh, initial compromise cards, and I'm gonna go ahead and shuffle those real quick because I want it to be randomized. And the next set of cards we have are internal password spray. Now, the internal password spray is part of the pivot and escalate cards. So the pivot and escalate cards, we have local privilege escalation, new service creation, accessibility features, credential stuffing, um, weaponizing active directory, that would be like bloodhound style attacks, uh, broadcast multicast po uh, poisoning, like link local multicast name resolution, Kerber roasting, and internal password spraying. So that's how an attacker, after they initially compromise a system, will actually move laterally within the organization and escalate their privileges in that organization. Um, the next card that we have are persistence cards. How is the attacker going to maintain access? Now, here's the sad thing about this deck of cards. Uh, the, the persistence cards 
are pretty much the only thing that organizations react to in an incident. Um, just persistence. They find the malware and that's it. They just kind of walk away. And really, we want to make sure if you're doing incident response that we have all four, right? You want to know how they got in, how they pivoted, did they escalate, how did they maintain access to the system, and how did they communicate? So the persistent mechanisms we have are evil firmware, which we already talked about, logon scripts, malicious browser plugins. Um, that's the one that's up here. Application shimming, uh, new user is added, malicious driver, DLL injection attacks, and malware service, just standard everyday malware. So that's the persistence card. So I'm gonna ra randomize these. I'm gonna shuffle these cards really quick. Get the audio aspect of this in, there we go. And then the final set of cards that we have for the attack deck for the Incident Master are C2 and Xfil. Now, C2 and Xfil is how the bad hacker communicates with their malware and gets their data off of the environment. So for that, we have HTTP as Xfil, Windows Background Intelligent Transfer Service Domain Fronting, uh, Gmail, Tumblr, Salesforce as a command and control, DNS as a command and control, and HTTPS as Xfil. So those are all the different main ways that we see attackers communicating on the network. So I'm gonna randomize those as well. So now I have those four types of cards are the cards that, um, that are absolutely uh, absolutely essential for building up the incident. For me, is the incident master. Now, I have someone that just put in, uh, Lars just said, Grammarly is a keylogger? Yeah, think about what Grammarly does. Uh, Grammarly takes everything that you type and it sends it up to the cloud and then it comes back and it's like, gives you spelling and grammar corrections. So literally everything that you type in your browser is Grammarly is getting that and then coming back. And it's basically saying, uh, yeah, yeah, the spelling looks good. Um, so that absolutely terrifies me. Um, I, I just really, really think that that's, uh, that's terrifying uh, for anybody as well. All right. Uh, so we've got somebody said typo on social engineering card. Yes, there's going to be typos. Absolutely. Um, there's no, there's no question about typos because I was involved in this process. All right. Uh, so let's move on. I, I do got <laughs> Go one question. Uh, yeah. Is the intent to align these cards roughly with the MITRE attack framework? Yes. Um, so yes and no. Uh, so whenever I was looking for cards, I was pulling from uh, BHIS pen test reports and also making sure it showed up in the MITRE attack framework. I used to have in here the actual MITRE number. Um, the big problem that I ran into with putting in the MITRE numbers is it made the cards a little bit more cluttered. Um, so we might even add them in and the links as well. But yes, it is It is absolutely uh, something that went into heavy consideration in actually building these. And these are based predominantly on the attacks that are very successful for us at BHIS as well, which also aligns to the MITRE framework. Great question. Any other questions? That's it for now. All right, sounds good. All right, so the procedure cards. Uh, the procedure cards are the defender cards. Uh, remember, you've got tools, you've got techniques, you've got links, you've got an overview of what each of these cards does. And each of these cards ties, again, to the actual attack. So there'll be a card called uh, NetFlow, Brozeek, and Rita analysis. There'll be a card for endpoint security protection analysis, web proxy or log review. There'll be a card for user behavioral and entity analytics and SIM log analysis, another one for firewall log review and endpoint protection analysis. So every single one of those DTECs has a corresponding procedure card for the defenders. So remember, the defender pulls four. So we have crisis management, uh, host isolation, endpoint analysis, user behavioral and entity analytics, endpoint security protection analytics. Uh, that's different than endpoint analytics. Endpoint security protection is actually reviewing the AV logs. Internal segmentation between the environment, NetFlow, Netflow Zeek, Bro, Rita analysis, firewall log review, and then SIM uh, log analysis or SIEM, as some people call it, and then server analysis. And that server analysis card is really designed to be a catch-all. So if you have a web server that's compromised, you can do server analysis. If you're going to review your proxy server, well, you could look at the server analysis. So you can use that for a variety of different things um, as well. But it's just basically the ability to analyze any server that'll give you a plus three modifier for that specific uh, action on it as well. So those are the procedures. Then the injects, as I said, the injects are pulled um, anytime a one or a 20 is rolled. 
And an inject is also pulled if you fail at rolling three times in a row. And it's meant to add some randomness to the game as a whole. So the injects that we have are honeypots are deployed, and that means the attacker has to give the pivot and escalate card. It was all just a pen test. Management has just approved the release of a new procedure. Uh, legal takes your only skilled incident handler into a, meet, uh, into a meeting. I'm going to come back to that one in a second. Bobby, the intern, kills the system you're reviewing. It happens far too often, and as I say. Uh, murder is never okay. Don't even think about it. Lead handler takes family medical leave. Give the defender a random procedure card. Take one random procedure card away from the defenders. Sim analysis, uh, analyst work comes back from training. And of course, the data is up to, uploaded to Pastebin. This one is evil. Uh, this one, anytime I'm working with an organization, I try to just sneak this one in because seeing how an organization handles an incident is fun. Seeing how an organization handles an incident that's out on the public interwebs is even funner. So these two cards, and then I'm going to break for some questions, are essential. I have two cards that basically deal with taking your lead incident handler out of the game. The reason why I have two cards for taking the lead incident handler out of the game is because when you play in a tabletop exercise, there's almost always that one person that bogarts the whole conversation, um, that answers the questions for absolutely everyone that is like, um, you know, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, what we do is we do this and, you know, we, we, we would look in the sim and we'd be able to handle that alert and we'd be able to handle this and we'd be able to do that. Or that's stupid. That's dumb. Let's not do that. And there's that one person, I, I guess it's usually referred to in IT as mansplaining. Um, I think, I think it's not just IT, uh, but there's always that one person that uh, just basically just handles the incident for everybody. So if you have like 10 people on a team, that one guy talks 95% of the time. So I literally have two calls, uh, two cards to neutralize that person. Um, and to be honest, I'm pretty sure that I would be that person as well. Um, so those two cards are there to get other people to start talking about incident response as well. All right. So any questions? I see just a ton of yeah. Of things coming in so yeah go ahead so what one of the questions is is it allowable for you to choose the incident cards instead of just randomly selecting them yeah absolutely uh the question uh is is a very good one if you if you're the incident master and you have a set of cards that just makes sense to you then absolutely you can choose your own incident cards and build your own uh, there's there's no rules if you're the incident master uh, you can do whatever you want you can use specific cards you can say oh, i'm not going to use this card but i'm going to use something else it's completely up to you um, these cards are designed to give you a good foundation of what these things uh, look like of course i just had somebody we need more neutralized cards as well <laughs> all right so any other questions hey john uh, how how does it work with non-technical people so how it works with non-technical people, um, I'm going to show that here in a second, um, specifically with procedures. Um, one of the ways I used to play this, and I found out at DerbyCon that I needed to change the way that I was playing it, is I would only give people four procedure cards, and they would seize up. They'd be like, well, these are the only things we can do, and they weren't able to start thinking through what were some of the additional activities they could do. They were completely fixated on the four procedure cards that they drew. And I would say things, well, you could do whatever you want. You just don't have to do those four things. And they're like, I, I, I have no idea. I just have no clue. What else could I do? And um, what I discovered is if you put all of the procedure cards down um, so they can see all the different procedures, and then they get four of those, but they can still see the four procedure cards, um, and all the rest of the cards, then they know that they get plus modifiers for these four cards, but then having the other cards displayed gives them the opportunity to think outside of those four cards that they've been given. So all of those are valid actions that can be taken, um, but the four cards are the only ones that they get the modifiers on. So this will really help if people are non-technical, they'll have a range of options that they can work with to actually deal with the incident as a whole, and as they play it more, they're going to get more familiar as far as what cards are more powerful and more useful in more scenarios. Like endpoint analysis is huge. Endpoint analysis is, is basically riddled through the entire persistence deck. Um, it just works so well for detecting so many of those different types of attacks. So they get a better idea on how that all works um, as well. So great question. All right. Any other questions? 
I, uh, just a little addition to that, um, they were asking about HR and legal people, and we definitely like to have those people in the room. We've done this a number mm -hmm. of times um, where those people get a sense of what's going on and the interaction that goes on during a cyber incident between uh, your legal team, your HR team, things like that. So having that person, those people participate is a really good thing. And if I was setting up a tabletop exercise and like we do for customers, instead of having the random injects and the one and the 20, I'll just throw them in the middle of the game. And like this one would be one that is designed specifically to pull in HR and legal. Um, if we go back to uh, data is uploaded up on, oh, I don't have that here. Data is uploaded up on Pastebin. Absolutely, you're going to get management and HR into that. A uh, user clicks a link. So you play the game and you try to pull those people in. So it isn't a purely technical exercise. Um, it also helps whenever you have legal in the room, when you're talking about procedures that are not written, when you're talking about technologies that you do not have, it really helps to get legal basically saying, um, yeah, do we need that? That seems like something that would be important. Um, and, and it just works out really well to get everyone going together. Right, any other questions before we go and play uh, two sample hands of this game? I, I think we'll do the sample games and that should either answer questions or create new ones. All right, sounds good. So let's get started. Um, so I basically set up two games and you're going to see um, what CJ's hand is. And I'm going to pull four random four random cards. So I've just built the incident. Um, so I have the initial attack and compromise. I have the pivot and escalate. I have the persistence and the C2. So as part of this game, as CJ's playing, um, he wants to take the actions that are on the screen to turn over these cards. Now remember, for each one of the cards, I have the detection mechanisms that you can use. Now, the actions that are big, those are the four procedures that CJ has that he can utilize as part of this incident. So right now he's reviewing, he's planning, he's plotting. These are the four different steps that he can do uh, to start turning over these cards that display the incident. And he will get a plus three modifier on any of those rolls. However, down here, we have all of the procedure cards. I just took a screenshot of it this morning, dropped it in the slide deck so you can see all of the procedure cards that are available to him. So he doesn't have to just do these four things. He can do any of those things that are down below, but only those four, he gets the plus modifiers. So I'm gonna go through and, um, I'm gonna go through really, really, really quick and I'm going to look at my cards. And we're good to go. All right, I've got it. All right, so CJ, uh, you come in Monday morning at eight o'clock and you are quickly notified by ASOC, the intern who's watching the intrusion detection alerts, that your web server on the outside of your environment received something like 10,000 different attack alerts last night, completely overloaded him. Um, he has no idea what to do. There's so many alerts and so many attacks that hit this web server. Um, he's just completely overwhelmed. So if you get that indication that you have a web server that was attacked brutally in the night before, what would be your next steps as part of uh, seeing and working through that incident? Um, I'd like to go look at the SIM log, I think. Okay, so we can actually check the SIM. And if you notice, CJ has this card and he gets a plus three modifier on his roll for his ridiculously large dice. So CJ, go ahead and roll and tell us what you rolled. 19. So he rolled a 19. Now, what I like to do uh, with the rolls, there's two ways that you can play it. You can be either a natural 20 or a natural one, uh, gets you the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, inject card. But in this situation, I'm going to uh, do two things. One, I'm going to give him the card because he was successful in actually identifying this. So he was able to identify that that particular system was compromised through an exploitable service. Um, it says an external service was misconfigured or publicly available. The attacker took advantage of this attack to pivot to internal resources. And for his detection, um, he was able to do that for log analysis as far as the SIM. So I'm gonna turn that card over. So CJ now knows that that system was compromised. So he got that card on his first roll, but because it's a plus three modifier, I'm also going to give him a, uh, I'm going to give him another inject. And the inject says the SIM analyst returns from Splunk training. So now any log related actions you take, 
you now get a plus two modifier in addition to every single roll. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. All right, CJ, so now you know that that system is compromised. It does not mean that that incident is over. No, 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 it does not. We have to identify, did the attacker pivot and escalate? Did the attacker do anything to persist? And how did the attacker communicate hmm. as command and control? So if we wanted to turn over these three cards, what would be some additional activities that you could do to identify what the attacker did to pull over these three things? Uh, well, segmentation would probably be good, but I'm heavily eyeing uh, my threat analytics, Rita. Okay, so you'll so you're basically going for the C2 card at that point, the C2 and Xfil card. So let's go ahead and do a roll on that. I get the plus three, right? You do get the plus three. Yep, yeah. it's one of the. Oh, twenty. So you got a natural 20. All right, awesome. So the first thing he gets is he gets DNS as a command and control. So the attacker took over the computer system with an exploitable service and put malware on that system. And we're able to identify that that malware is communicating through DNS. And of course, you can pick that up pretty easily with tools like uh, Rita. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull a random card and we pull... Okay, so the random card that you just pulled on that because you roll exceptionally well is Honey Pots are deployed. Now what this card does is the Honey Pots are set up and it basically says the Incident Master must show the Pivot and Escalate card, which just so happens to be a card he does not have. So this flips over via Honey Pots. He's able to identify that the attacker was doing an internal password spray on the environment. And like I said, you can do the card that'll actually turn that over as the inject. You also could have detected it with user behavioral and entity analytics or doing SIM log analysis again. So very, very good. Um, this game is going very quickly because you roll very well. You still have to figure out, is there any malware on that system? Now, one of the reasons why this is key is, yeah, we know that system's compromised, but we need to kind of develop a better detect as far as how, what is the malware the attacker used because they might be using that malware on other computer systems. So CJ, if you wanted to look at a computer and identify how the attacker is able to get malware on that computer system, what would be some techniques that you could use that'll actually assist you in identifying what is the malware or the persistence mechanisms because it's not always malware uh, that the attacker had used. Uh, I guess the endpoint analysis. Yep. Then... Do endpoint analysis. You can use incident response cheat sheets to look for anything untoward on that computer. So let's go ahead and roll. Two. All right. So that failed, even with the, with the plus three modifier. Um, it absolutely failed. Uh, you did not identify endpoint analysis. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the only way that you can identify if there's malware on that system. Um, you can do endpoint analysis. If you look down on the bottom, there's also endpoint security protection analysis that's tech checking like the AV logs on that computer system as well. Um, since it is a server, you could do server analysis and you could also do SIM. You could actually check the logs coming off of that computer system. So you still have actions that you can take. So I already played the SIM, but... Yep. Uh, so can I play it again? Um, you have to wait three turns before you can rerun the same procedure card. Uh, I'll do the endpoint security protection analysis for a thousand, Alec. All right, let's give it a go. Twenty. <laughs> oh, this game is so easy. Is that the dice that lights up every time yes, you get a twenty? Yes, it's, it's blinking. It's, you have to bang it. It has to land, and then it was blinking. All right, blinking. so. By doing the endpoint protection analysis, you're able to identify that there was a malicious driver that was installed on that computer system. Um, you were able to identify that. So pretty cool. So that is the first game. So uh, let's go through and let's answer some questions. CJ did an exceptional job. I'm going to quote unquote trash the cards for that incident that we just did because we're going to do a brand new incident here in just a second. So let me pause for any questions that people may have. Uh, once a procedure card is used, can it be used again? Yeah, you have to wait three turns. Um, otherwise, people would just do the exact same procedure again and again and again. Um, so yes, you have to wait three turns. Any other questions? Uh, so we need a 20-sided dice to play? You do. Um, you can also get uh, dice apps as well. Uh, so I have... So I actually have an app on my phone uh, that I can set up. I can roll D20 
Um, I can roll D12, I can roll D100 if I want, but you can, you can actually run these apps and there's tons of free apps available on various app stores uh, to get that set up. Good question. So any other questions? That's it for now. All right, let's move on to the next scenario. So he pulled a whole bunch of new procedure cards. Hold on. And when he pulled the new procedure cards, he ended up with a couple of procedures that were the same as the last time. He got Rita again, and he got endpoint analysis, but this time he pulled crisis management and firewall log review. Um, so as you can see, different procedures will give you different strengths, and it also changed the way you approach dealing with the incident as a whole. So now I'm gonna build the incident. I'm gonna pull one initial compromise card. I'm gonna pull one lateral movement card, pivot and escalate. I'm gonna pull one persistence card. I'm gonna pull one C2 exfil. We have now built an entirely different incident with different techniques. So let me look at this one. All right. So you come in Tuesday afternoon at 3.15, uh, coming back from lunch. Of course, uh, CJ was eating at Chipotle uh, for lunch, as he's wont to do on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. And when he gets back to the office after a nice long lunch, um, the organization is actually blocking a lot of social media sites. And uh, they noticed that they're, one of the systems was going to a whole bunch of social media sites, and the user swears that he never goes to any social media sites ever. So if you have a system that's trying to go to some social media sites and the user's like, dude, we totally don't do that, what would be your next action, sir? Uh, endpoint analysis. Cool, all right, so we go to the user's workstation, we do some endpoint analysis, so go ahead and do a roll. Did I have a margarita at Chipotle? Uh, no, you did not. Oh, um, good, because that'd be like saying to Save too. margaritas for Thursdays and Fridays. Ah, uh, perfect. Mondays. All right. Yeah. Uh, eight. Eight, nine, 10, 11. Ooh, yeah. wow, that was close. So what you were able to detect uh, with that very, very close roll, once again, showing you how much procedures help, is that the attacker was using application shimming. So on Windows computer system, they used to have something called uh, the application compatibility toolkit. It's now called the Windows Assessment and Deployment Kit. And this allows you to create executables that uh, when they run, they think that there's different directories and different processes and folders and files. And uh, it's a way to fake out executables into running on newer Windows systems, but it can also be used as a persistence mechanism. So you can actually use application shimming. So the attackers use application compatibility to trick applications into not seeing the ports, directories, and files of services that an attacker wants to hide. And of course, we have two links associated with this. We actually do have the MITRE attack technique, and this one is T1138, and then also the Microsoft documents on how to get started with the uh, application assessment deployment kit. So you got that card right out of the bat. So you saw that those were there. And usually when you're looking at application compatibility toolkit or shims, they usually show up in the installed programs directory. So if you go into add remove programs, you'll see the shims. Unless of course you shim that and then you're hiding the shims from showing the thing that shows the shims. But that gets really, really confusing. But we have a couple of places where you can do that. So you got one card out of the way immediately. So um, uh, what did you roll again? What was that? It was eight. just barely, right? Eight, nine, 10, 11. All right, so that's fantastic. So that shows the value of doing the uh, procedures. Um, but we still haven't figured out how we got compromised in the first place, how they may have pivoted and moved laterally and escalated privileges, and how they were communicating for command and control. So what would be your next action to try to pull down these three cards? How they got compromised. Um, hmm. I guess I want to do the endpoint security protection analysis. All right, let's go ahead and do a roll on that. All right. Nine. All right, uh, endpoint security protection analysis is a procedure, but it's not a procedure that you have. So that particular procedure fails, which believe it or not, whenever I turn it over, it's actually gonna make sense why that one would not have worked all that well for that particular scenario. So that one didn't work, so what would be another thing that you could do to try to identify how a system or a user was compromised? Jeez. Hmm, endpoint analysis? We can go ahead. We can try endpoint analysis. Let's go for it. Five. Oh my gosh. Just completely failing at rolling. 
Um, so how many failed rolls is that? That's just two that's so far, two. right? Two. Yep, that's two. two failures in a row, and that's a problem. Um, and how many rolls are we in now? We're three rolls in? Just three, yep. Yep, I'm keeping track now because if we get to 10, you lose. All right, so that one failed as well. So what would be the next action that you might try to take? And remember, one failed roll, we're pulling an inject. Crap. So if I don't see how like Rita will work on that specific thing, do I just get to play that card randomly? Yep, do I you have can to try to do that card randomly, and that card may work for another one of these techniques as well. So you may not work for that initial compromise, but you may be able to figure out how they're communicating C2 and maybe how they pivoted and escalated as well. I just, I feel like I need my uh, pause three here. Okay. I'm going to go with Rita. <laughs> All right, go with Rita. Give it a roll. Two. It rolled a two. Oh. two. So now we're at how many failed rolls in a roll? That's three. three. And we are also um, three failed rolls, and we're at three rolls in. This isn't looking good. And a lot of these techniques you can't use again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of cheat on the inject, and I'm going to pull the data is uploaded to paste bin uh, inject. Now, uh, when we're working tabletop exercises, this is really where the legal and management team come in and shine. And it takes an hour sometimes to get through these. So how would they actually deal with that? Now, lucky for you, you have the crisis management card. And yeah. the crisis management card counteracts the data uploaded to paste bin inject card. Now, usually whenever that card is pulled, as I said, it's, it's for conversation purposes. How would the organization handle it? How would we contact paste bin to have it removed? Did it show up anyplace else? All of those different things. Um, would come into play. Um, but I like to show how those two cards counteract each other. Now we're four rolls in and we still have three cards that we need to pull. Now where Rita and Security Onion and Network Traffic anal Analysis failed you, you could still do things like firewall log review, segmentation, those types of things to try to counteract some of these other cards. Yeah, I need a win. I'll do firewall log rule review. All right, let's go for it, give it a roll. 19. Oh, finally, 19. So with that one, um, you pull over the card and it says that Gmail, Tumblr, and Salesforce and Twitter is used as command and control, which is kind of a pirate victory. You kind of knew that's what was going on because you had that initial um, stage from the incident that you were reviewing, but the firewall was able to confirm it. So very good. We've got that. We're on roll five, right? Is it five or is it six? I think uh, this will be roll six. Oh, this is roll six. So we still have to do how are we compromised and how do we pivot and escalate? Now, um, with the how we were compromised, you could use like you could look at, uh, um, I don't know, you could look at uh, SIM analysis. You still have a bunch of things that you can actually. Yeah, with. I'll do the SIM analysis. All right. Let's give it a roll. Two. <laughs> Sorry, as an incident responder, I shouldn't, shouldn't take so much joy uh, from your rolling. But your first game was was damn near a perfect game. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. yeah we've got it. We've got to do that. So sim analysis has failed you. Uh, we can now look at like I don't know user behavioral and entity analytics. Let's go ahead. And no, I did that one. You did UBEA? I thought I did that one. I don't think you've done that one. I should have written them down. If we if we were playing, we'd have the. Yeah, if we were playing them, we would actually be writing these down as we'd go uh, for doing incident response with this. But no one's calling you on it, so go ahead and let's go ahead and roll it. <laughs> A two. A two. What are we at? We're at seven rolls or eight? Seven. So, I'm writing them down. We're at seven rolls. Oh. Uh, we're at seven rolls. So we're going to pull another random inject out of this. Let's see if there's any of these random injects. I got to pull out some of them. That uh, that's not a fun. that's huh? not another three fails. I get one yeah, more. Yeah, you, you rolled. Is, are you, are you at three fails? Or is it just I, two? I fail, 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 success, fail, fail. I get one okay, more. So you got one more. You get one more. Jeez, I'm uh, just gonna you, go random. Isolation. Yeah, you, isolation. Go for it. A two. <laughs> now I get it. So now with this random card, you got. It was all just a pen test. Um, Must have been you, Black Hills. Yeah, it does actually say that for the link. It says Black Hills Information Security dot com at the bottom. Somebody's like, does he have a loaded dice? I don't know. The last one he rolled like four twenties, so that was that was cool. I had two twenties um, and two eighteens, and then three twos in a row. 
Yeah. So, um, so now I turn over everything because it's a pen test. So initially you were compromised via password spraying. And we talk about blog posts on how to do password spraying and tools and how you could have detected it. Unfortunately, this has three different ways that you can detect it and you failed at rolling at all three. And then also curve roasting was what was used for pivot and escalate inside of the environment, um, which really, really absolutely um, like just you failed at rolling all of those as well. So that kind of sets up the game. Um, so let's hand it over to questions uh, for anybody that they have. No, I didn't make 420 as a joke and a, re a reference. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the question does the, was, does the incident master decide which card to reveal based on the procedure? Absolutely. Um, it is absolutely up to the incident master on how they would uh, decide which cards are turned over based on which actions. Because as an incident master, you're going to fill them trying to figure out how that system was compromised, lateral movement, things of that nature. So it's completely up to the incident master. And I played this with uh, college students, and I, I'll help them out a lot and going in the right direction to trying to get them moving. Um, but after somebody plays this game and they start going through the cards and they try to learn what each of the cards are, it tends to make them much better at the game over time. Another question is what happens if they fail without getting bailed out by a pen test card? You keep going until you get to 10 rolls. Uh, so if CJ would have rolled two more times, uh, success or fail for those last two, um, he would have failed the entire incident. And I do that because I want even failed incidents to have a defined end point uh, where we can turn over everything and we can start having conversations about what we would do um, if things fail. And that that is actually kind of a key point because so many customers and organizations get so hung up on, you know, we would use this tool, we would we would check our logs for carbon black. And it's like, well, carbon black has failed you. What now? And that is a huge question, the what now? as well um so uh, da, 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 da. so let me see do we have any other ones yeah i like this one dave just said you should have a card that if things are going really bad just pay the ransom in bitcoin um, <laughs> john uh, one comment because we're running out of time uh, a lot of people were asking like can i do this can i do that can i can i add this modifier can i do these things yes. and, and the answer i was just getting everyone was like yeah sure the incident master you can yeah. You can detail or, to your organization. Or I would just say, no, if you start modifying my game, I'm coming to your house. I'm coming to your place <laughs> of work and I'm showing you how to play it right. No. Um, so you want to a bunch of the games I have a bunch of the games I have have house rules. So absolutely feel free to be creative. I wanted to inject levels, right? Like to have levels of malware and, and levels of training in your organization. So that you can have, you know, plus one, plus two, plus three in the plus five Vorpal weapon. But yeah. But modify it, make it, because again, the point is to, to highlight and to learn and to have conversations. So that, that's what yep. you're facilitating. And, you know, with cubicles and compromises, there's a rule that you can add into this as well. Like anybody that is trained in that action gets a plus two modifier on that action. So you may not have the procedures, but someone's trained in it, you get a plus two modifier. If you have a procedure and someone who has training on it, then you would get a plus five modifier for that action. Um, so really, like CJ said, house rules work really, really, really well um, with, with this entire thing. And honestly, the way most people are using this, aside from tabletop exercise education, uh, just going through and it's like, I've never heard of LLM and R. I've never heard of cred sniper. I've yes. never heard of these different tools. And it gives them kind of an opportunity to try to learn as much as they possibly could. Oh, That's I like this. Uh, Lucas just said, you should add some blank cards. Um, and I think he's kind of talking about uh, legacy. So like if you play risk legacy or pandemic legacy, there are stickers and things that you can get that are actually blank. And you can you can kind of add that in however you want uh, as well. All right, well everybody, that's kind of it for our time. Um, we're going to stick around uh, for a little bit longer, and we can answer some more questions. But as far as the core webcast, that's it. Thank you very much for attending. Mm -hmm.